Thank you, friends. Thanks for coming out on this cool Saturday morning. So we have a really fun program planned today. We're going to talk a little bit about my work as a spiritual hypnotherapist. And then we'll be taking questions. If we have questions, we'll do a little Q&A period. Then we'll take a break. And then we will do a group past life and meet your spirit guide regression. So that's going to be the highlight and the fun part. So you're going to have to sit through this boring stuff to get to the good, good stuff. <laughs> Did you hear the one about the three-foot-tall psychic who busted out of jail? The newspaper headline the next day said, Small, medium, at large. <laughs> I feel like a little bit like I'm a stand-up comic, so I thought I'd better start off with <laughs> break the ice there. Newspapers, right? Who, who reads newspapers anymore? <laughs> a couple of us. I remember the LA Times used to, like Sunday LA Times used to be like this big, and it's like, it's like that. So, yeah, time. In fact, I remember as a child, one of the big field trips was going to the LA Times building in Los Angeles. I don't know if any of you have done that. Really fun, and you know, back in the old days when they used to print the papers and all of that. I remember they even gave us a piece of movable type, like they used to use back in the day. So, time, you know, things change with time. We'll be doing some time traveling today, actually, together, so that should be a lot of fun. Well, so let's talk about life between lives. This is really the bread and butter of my hypnotherapy practice. Life Between Lives was developed by a gentleman named Michael Newton in the 70s and 80s. And we'll talk about that. But first of all, maybe let's go back, further back in time just to remind us that the afterlife and reincarnation and these concepts, spirit guides, all of this has been with us for a long, long time. So let's take a look here. I do this right. Ever since the earliest times, ancient man, cavemen, Neanderthals. We find Neanderthal burials that they are putting flowers in the graves and so we're inferring that, wow, they're believing in some kind of afterlife. I mean, this could be 200,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, 50,000 years. We don't really understand what they were thinking exactly, but we're guessing that I mean, they could have just been decorating the graves, but we're guessing that they had some kind of belief in an afterlife. So, I think it's an idea that's been with us since, you know, we've been conscious, I guess you could say. And then that's developed into almost all cultures across the world, shamanism of some kind. We have, uh, in every clan or tribe or group, we have these specialists who, it's their job to connect with the gods or to mediate between the humans and the gods. I would assume that through all of history we've had our people who are born just psychic or open. And so these people have, you know, connected with 
higher beings or the divine in some way. This is pretty interesting. And again, I think it cuts across all around the world, most all cultures. Then flashing forward into some of the great civilizations, they have developed uh, religious ideas about the afterlife. We know in Mesopotamia, um, Sumeria, what's now Iraq, the Fertile Crescent, even before that in Turkey and perhaps Syria and the Levant, we've had these intense, amazing religions. And down into Egypt, where they had this amazing civilization for two or three thousand years, and they developed this very intense religion, almost way of life that has to do with the afterlife. And I was looking, uh, I was doing a little research about Egypt just recently for this uh, meeting, and I found that besides just uh, weighing their life with the feather and the whatever that stuff is, um, they also believed in reincarnation. So I wasn't aware of that. I knew they had this intense underworld or afterlife. But yeah, they actually believed in reincarnation. They believed that they would return to kind of the source or the mother, and then they would be born again into a, a, another body. So it's very interesting. Again, these ideas have been around for so very long. It makes you wonder why. And then a bit later in India, you know, they really developed with Hinduism and some of the other religions there. They've really developed almost to a science these ideas of reincarnation, you know, the wheel of reincarnation, the afterlife, these kinds of things. And so, a lot of our even modern day beliefs and New Age beliefs hark back to Hinduism and Indian ideas. And then over in Central and Western Europe, let's say 500 BC, maybe 1000 BC, 500 BC, then around the time of Christ, the Celtic peoples the sort of native peoples of Central and Western Europe, their priests, they call the Druids, or we call the Druids, they had a really intense belief in the afterlife and in reincarnation as well. And so, these ideas survive. Into ancient Greece, uh, Plato was a great philosopher around 350, 375 BC. He wrote a work called uh, The Republic, consisting of 10 books. I believe it's the 10th book of The Republic where he talks about there's a story of a soldier who is killed in battle. They lay him out like on a table or something and he doesn't decay, but about 12 days later, he revives, he wakes up. And they say, oh my gosh, what happened? And he has these amazing stories, these amazing tales of what he experienced. And this includes meeting spiritual guides. It includes <clears throat> observing people choosing their next lifetime and sort of analyzing that. If a person chooses an easy lifetime, it's sort of like, oh, they're taking the easy way out. If a person chooses a more difficult lifetime, it's like, yeah, they're really going for it. So this is, you know, three or four hundred years before Jesus already have stories of people 
meeting with spiritual guides, choosing their next lifetime. Very amazing, amazing to me. And so flashing forward about 2,000 years, so taking a big leap here, I found this book recently. It was published in around 1857. That's about three or four years before Abraham Lincoln became president. It's a long time ago. And this gentleman, Alan Kardec, a French gentleman using this pen name, I forget his real name. He worked with these two daughters of a friend who apparently could channel uh, very interesting information. And so he started recording these channelings and then devising questions and asking them questions about the afterlife and what happens when we die. And so the result is this book called The Spirit's Book. And in this book, these girls detail the afterlife and what goes on there. Spirit guides choosing other lives, mm, even higher beings than spirit guides, sort of elders, what we now call Council of Elders. Lots of these kinds of things. So again, these ideas have been around for a long time. And then jumping forward again, maybe 25 or 30 years, a Russian woman named Helena Blavatsky sort of tuned in to the, I don't know, if it was the Hindu ideas of reincarnation, it was sort of ascended masters that she was tuning into, but she kind of devised this theosophy this uh, you know wisdom of gods or the gods very occultish very cool uh, sort of gathered a lot of followers and these became some very important writers I think Annie B. Sant and Rudolf Steiner and some uh, others up into the maybe 1900 the turn of the century so bringing these ideas, again, of reincarnation, of souls, ascension, of souls developing, uh, raising levels, a very interesting woman. And I think a lot of New Age things today kind of uh, have their foundations in this woman and what she brought forward. Now flashing forward again, maybe 100 years, in the 1970s, there was a very interesting woman named Helen Wambach, Dr. Helen Wambach. She began doing studies and doing group sessions, such as we're going to do today in a while. And in these group sessions, she would take people to past lives and the very interesting thing would be that interlife or afterlife information would come forward in those sessions. It's not just, uh, you know, die and then born again. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on in between. And so she started to find these things out. People started to report very interesting interlife thing. Again, spirit guides planning future lives, reviewing lives, these types of things. And so she was a sort of pioneer in these things. In the mid to late 70s and 80s, a gentleman came along, Dick Sutphin, someone I just really resonate with and I had the pleasure of studying with and meeting a few times at seminars. He wrote a very, very meaningful book called You Were Born Again to Be Together, which is about how lovers tend to incarnate over and over again in different lifetimes. And I think I read that around 79. 
and it just appealed to my romantic side and as well as like wow the idea that souls can can meet again and again and again and then he wrote other books and came up with a lot of early deep spiritual ideas such as again planning your future lives going to temples of healing doing all these amazing spiritual things and so I don't know how many books he has, maybe 15 or 18 books. But another big thing that he did was create these recordings so people could ex experience their own personal regressions. I think he has a library of over 300 uh, different recordings from past life regressions to all kinds of spiritual ex explorations. And so I just wanted to pay tribute to him in this talk because he's meant a lot to me and I still use a lot of his techniques because they're very effective and they have a very high spirituality, a very high vibration. Uh, recently we found a book that was published in the 1980s, I believe the mid 80s, Life Between Life. It's the first time this sort of phrase had come into my awareness. And this was a physician, Dr. Joel Witten, and his uh, co-writer Joe Fisher. Fabulous book, if you get a chance to see that one. Pick that one up, I'm sure it's available. And uh, in this book, they start describing these between-life <coughs> sessions. He does past lives, but he also goes between our lifetimes and so starts to flesh out what happens in the afterlife. And then flashing forward to Michael Newton, Journey of Souls, a very seminal book, came out in 1994. Dr. Newton kind of stumbled upon these ideas and these experiences. He was a psychologist in Los Angeles and he kind of stumbled upon these ideas of the afterlife and what goes on in the afterlife. You know the old story that he writes about is there was a woman, a client that he had, very depressed and he used all of his psychological techniques and just couldn't really help her very much. So I think he remembered back in his education and he was taught hypnosis. So he said, let's try hypnosis. Let's see what happens. So he hypnotizes this woman and says, let's go to a time when and you were happy, maybe you had friends or loved ones around. And she, she became very full of light and very excited and very happy. And he's, he asked about this and, and she says, you know, these are my friends in spirit. She was not in a body. This is a time when she was a spirit between her lifetimes. And so he scratched his head at that one and thought, what the heck is this? And so he started exploring that more and more. And over maybe 20, 30 years, he systematically explored and developed a technique that can take basically anyone into their existence between their, their lifetimes. And so, Destiny of Souls, another book came out in 2000, I believe, and then another book, Life Between Lives, sharing his techniques. And then around maybe 2001, I think maybe he was approached by a hypnosis organization or somehow he got together with an organization. He began teaching his method at some other organizations' um, seminars. 
And then maybe two or three years of doing that, he decided to create his own um, organization, which he did. It was called the Society for Spiritual Regression. And then it was later renamed to the Newton Institute. And so the Newton Institute trains qualified hypnotherapists in Michael Newton's techniques. And so I was lucky enough in 2004 to attend a training in um, Studio City here in Southern California. They move the trainings around the country and around the world. They usually have maybe two, maybe three trainings a year. And so it just worked out for me. I was able to attend that training and wow, it was really life changing for me. I think we spent about five days and I got to experience my first Life Between Lives session as a client. We had partners and I got to uh, give a session as well. I remember driving home from that seminar and just going on the freeway and looking around at the other cars and the people and thinking, my God, everyone here on the earth has this incredible soul history behind them this tapestry of, of lifetimes. And now I have the skills and the tools to help them remember that. So that was the uh, epiphany for me, if you will. So let's talk a little bit about the Life Between Lives session and what happens in that type of session. Again, as I described, that is the main work that I do along with past life regression. I also do general hypnotherapy for people with particular issues. But those two are the, the biggies. Then I kind of developed another session which is sort of in between those, which is a past life and spirit guide where we go to a past lifetime. Excuse me, and then we go through the life and then through the death and up into spirit and meet with a guide and perhaps chat with them for a few people can bring a few questions so that's what we're going to do today in our group session we're going to do a past life and spirit guide group regression should be fun I look forward to it all right so the life between lives So, we use hypnosis. There are many ways, as you know, to access our history, our soul's memories. There are psychics who can do this, there are mediums. Sometimes we just have spontaneous memories or dreams, these kinds of things, visions. But hypnosis is one way to help almost anyone to sort of put their conscious mind to the side and allow these soul memories to come through. It's pretty reliable that way. So, you know, the H word, hypnosis, there's a lot of baggage to do with that. And it's sort of a blessing and a curse for people in my profession, as you know because of expectations, because of Hollywood and movies and television shows, which tend to over-dramatize the effects of hypnosis, right? So, so people are expecting to like go to the IMAX theater and see themselves moving across the screen. It may be like that. It's like that for some clients, but it may not be. So, you know, the bell curve of science kind of goes like that, where some people go super deep. Everyone's different. Some people go super deep, and I can barely get them to speak, and then it's like they're talking from the grave. <laughs> so, those are fun. And then I have my sort of medium subjects, 
where they're still aware of who they are and what they're doing and where they are, but they're opening another window into their past. And then I have the lighter subjects, which I tend to be a pretty light subject, where I'm pretty awake, pretty aware, and yet still able to access information from my, again, my the tapestry of my soul's memories. So it's a pretty interesting thing. I have some people that become very emotional, and I have the Kleenex, you know, the tissues that are waiting. I go through the tissues week by week. Um, and that's good. It's a cathartic experience for a lot of people. I mean, me, I tend to be pretty objective. And I'm usually just like, uh, in my own sessions as a client, I'm just like, oh, got eaten by a tiger again. Dang it. Hate when that happens. So, you know, it's different for everyone. And there's a lot of definitions for hypnosis. My definition would sort of be, hypnosis is a subtle way of opening the doors to your inner self. So it's not like, you know, it doesn't have to be like a hammer on your head that really knocking you out. It can be very, very subtle. So let's be aware of that today. So in the Newton method of life between lives, he has a way of taking people back kind of slowly so we'll go back through the childhood. We'll go back through, actually, adulthood and then childhood, kind of step by step. We may stop at a place here or there, take a look, sort of uh, what they call memory warm-ups, just getting things going, moving backwards. Then we'll move all the way back into the womb, which is very interesting, the time before you're born when you're gestating, you're growing inside of your mother. There's a lot of fascinating information to be found there. Like when do you, as a soul, actually come in to that fetus? You know, for some people, it's not until after it's even born, because they're like, I don't want to go through that mess. I don't want to see the blood and feel the squeezing and all that. I just came in like, you know, two days old. Okay. And I have other clients that come in like almost at conception and say, okay, it's dividing. Four cells, eight cells, 16. Okay, it's, it's alive. It's going to be me. So they might come in. And then they move back out. People tend to come in and out of the womb the soul energy comes in and out of the baby because it's not that exciting uh, for nine months waiting for the, for the baby to grow and develop. There are lots of more exciting things to do in the universe. People have projects going on. People have work. People have study. They want to study for this life to come. Some people are just fooling around like at, at the amusement park or something. Hey, I'm going to be going into this life. There's going to be challenges. I'm going to live it up here before I go in. So it's very individual and very interesting. I would say that most of my clients come in around the third or fourth month of gestation. They want to check out the baby, make sure that it's developing OK make sure that it's viable, that kind of thing. Some souls will do modifications to the fetus, to the infant. They will sort of do something similar to energy healing to make certain modifications. Maybe I need to make the brain a little more open or a little faster, or there's a problem with the structure, I need to arrange the bones or the tissues, 
or there's maybe there's a problem with the heart. I need to reform that. So it's pretty amazing realizing what people can do to the child, this body that's going to be their vehicle in the world. Also in the womb we can we can already touching in with the mother. What's going on with the mother? What's she feeling? What's she thinking? Is she happy? Does she want to have a child? Maybe she's not really too excited about that. Maybe she's worried. Maybe she's stressed. Does this affect you at all? What your mother is thinking and her energy, does this affect the baby? And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. It's very interesting. Some people will say, well, of course it's affecting me. All that energy is affecting me. And then other people will say, no, I'm shielded from that. I'm just observing her. In fact, some people will send their mother, you know, healing vibes or love or light. Yeah, she's really stressed. I'm trying to calm her down because <clears throat> the more calm I can make her feel, the just more pleasant it is for me to be here. So, very, very interesting, the information we can learn there. So then from the womb, we'll sort of leapfrog kind of over the interlife into another human lifetime. It's just part of Dr. Newton's method. So we go, we go and visit a past life. We'll explore the past life. It's interesting because when we do a past life regression, we might drop in at any point along that timeline you know, from birth to death, or even after, or even a little before. So we call, I uh, sort of came up with the term, the drop-in point for that life. So, okay, here we are in another lifetime. Is it daytime or nighttime? How old are you? What's going on? I'm 36, I'm walking down the road. So we kind of dropped in in the middle, maybe. So then we'll go back, I like to go back and explore the childhood maybe of the life. I like to understand if they had a family, if they had a mother, a father, what kind of home they may have come from. And then we'll work our way through some significant moments of the life. Maybe there was a time when you left home. Maybe there was a time when you got married. Maybe there was a time when you birthed a child became a mother or a father. Maybe there was a time when your parents passed away. And then we'll go through that type of thing. So we'll go all the way through toward the end of the life, maybe to the very last day. So last day, be there now. Where are you? What's happening? And so they'll report uh, most deaths. Most people, it's just they're old and they don't feel well, and they're very tired, and they're lying down, and someone's, you know, mopping their brow and giving them soup, and, but they can realize that they're on their way out. Occasionally, we'll get those exciting deaths of, you know, you got run over by a horse, or, you know, eaten by a wolf, or, <laughs> you know, war. People die in wars, unfortunately that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's pretty fascinating to go through, but uh, I hope it's comforting to you to realize that most deaths seem to be sort of natural causes, old age, that type of thing. So we'll go through that death. Then what? We're going to rise up out of that body. We're going to make the transition from the human earthly life into the spiritual reality. We're going to drop away that earthly life, sort of like, 
You know when you come home at the end of a long day, you just drop your coat on the ground? Uh, we're going to do that with the body and the lifetime. We're going to let it go. We're going to let it go. We're going to rise up. Rising, 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 ascending, ascending. Moving through layers and levels of dimensions. We're crossing over. We're shifting our frequency into the spiritual frequencies. We're leaving the density of the earth behind. And we're rising up, up, up. And so, now what? What's going to happen? What's going to happen next? Where do we go? I started telling people, because it just came to me, this isn't Newton's thing, but, you know, now you can do whatever you want to do. You could go wherever you want to do, and at the speed of thought, you could be there. There are things to do. There are places to go. There are people to see. Or if you just want to sit under a tree for a thousand years, that's your choice. You can do whatever you want. And it's absolutely true. We can do whatever we want. We have total free will. And now we're out of the body, that's even magnified. We can really do what we want. And so I kind of try to leave it open for people. Instead of steering them here or there, I try to leave it open for my one-on-one -on -one clients. Um, you can do whatever you want. And some people will just say, I'd like to do nothing for a while. I'm like, that sounds good. I'm going to sit here and be quiet while well, you do nothing for a while. So they're just resting. What they're really doing is re-acclimatizing to the spiritual vibrations. They've been in this struggle, in this earthly life. They need to let go of that and remember what it's like to be, <clears throat> excuse me, remember what it's like to be in this, you know, in the light. There's this beautiful light of heaven that moves through us and re-energizes us, starts to restore our energy. So one thing that often happens is people will meet up with a spirit guide. We all have spiritual guides. These are teachers, souls, who have agreed to help us out, kind of like a big brother or big sister, or a guardian angel. Often we have a primary spirit guide, one person who is really committed, who was assigned to us and said, I'm going to help you through this for the next 90 eons, or however long it's going to take to get you to that next level. And so, in our session, sitting down maybe, talking with this very wise and loving person. It's just a beautiful introduction to the spirit world. There tends to be a sense of unconditional love and acceptance. There tends to be a, sometimes they will enfold the person in their sort of wings and their energy and it just makes you feel so much better. It makes you feel loved and full and restored. So in our session, I will try to utilize this time by talking with the spirit guide. I will talk to the spirit guide directly. We'll set it up where I say, I'm going to speak to your guide directly. I'm going to ask him or her to respond in your mind or even through your voice as if channeling them. So we're going to kind of cut out the middleman of you. You don't have to think about it too much, hopefully. We're going to have a dialogue with your spirit guide. So I'll start asking questions. Well, what about that lifetime, that past lifetime that we lived? What was that all about? What was the purpose of that life? What were they trying to do? 
And why are we shown, out of all the lives they've lived, why are we shown that one? What does that have to do with the current life and the current situation? So there'll always be some sort of a meeting point. It'll always mesh. Because in the past life part, a simpler request that we go to a past life that has a meaningful connection to the current lifetime. I don't know how that works, but I'm glad that it does. And so we'll talk to the spirit guide about this. And then we'll ask them, you know, what was the purpose of the past life? What were they trying to do? What was the soul doing there? What were they trying to learn? They will also talk about the current life. Well, what about the current life? What's the purpose now? What are we trying to do? And so we'll have all these questions we can talk to spirit guides about. Then I like to use the spirit guide as sort of a tour guide, like uh, as if we're going through Disneyland of the afterlife. I'll ask the spirit guide, well, what would you like them to experience next? <clears throat> there are several places and experiences that Newton has found. And new ones that we find all the time that Michael Newton didn't even know about. So, one of the really nice places to go is to a place of healing. A place of restoring your soul. Living an earth lifetime can leave you a little chipped up and beaten up. Uh, even your soul energy needs to be restored to your full capacity. Kind of like plugging in your electric car or you know, your phone, right? You need to get it up to 100%. And so this restoration or healing can take many, many forms. Very amazing the way we, in our human way, sort of put a face on what's really happening just in an energetic way. So people will perceive like, it's a temple of healing and I go in and I lay on this table and there are beings that are shining lights on me. But people describe, I'm going to a waterfall outside and I just stand under the waterfall and it, you know, it restores me, it, it fills me with energy and love and power. Just amazing. Um, I've had people just wherever they are, wherever they happen to be as a spirit, have healers come to them. Oh, they just come to me. And there's, they're all around me. And they're shining this divine energy on me. And so, fills you up and gets you ready to go through the next steps in the spirit world. So again, as I explained, you can go wherever you want. One place that people, and one thing they like to do, is reunite with their soul group. We have, in spirit, we have groups, just like we have families on earth. We have soul groups that we play with and learn with in spirit. And we also come down together and incarnate sometimes um, in different roles. Maybe there's a group and we're working on a particular item. Uh, how to have more unconditional love. So you get your friend and you say, hey, I want you to come down to this life with me and I want you to uh, challenge me. Give me a hard time about some stuff. Maybe even betray me and stab me in the back. I want to see if I can find it in myself to forgive you and work, you know. If, if what, we've, what we learn in spirit, if I can bring that through in the human sense, you know, because when we incarnate, we generally, as if we take a drink of forgetfulness, we generally forget this whole spirit stuff because we want to focus on this human life. 
We want to focus on this human life. We forget where we came from and who we really are. And that probably explains a lot in our world. But, yeah, and so, you know, we get with our friends and we make plans. Have you ever gotten together with your friends and planned like a road trip? Something like that? Kind of similar to that. So, you know, when, when we're young in the U.S. here, we have elementary school, maybe junior high school, or middle school, and high school. When we're in, say, third grade, we have one homeroom, one teacher. As we grow and develop, we'll have more classes when we go to junior high and high school. Maybe we'll have six classes. So I find it's the same thing in spirit. As over time we grow and develop and develop more interests, we develop other groups. So we might have an interest group. These are artists. Or this group is explorers. Or this class or group is teachers. Or learning to be guides. So we can develop many different groups as we go. And so we can touch in with our sort of homeroom, you know, our closest family. We can touch in with our working groups, our interest groups. Very cool. And then sometimes we can also recognize, let's say you go to a group of people who are artists or healers, and then I'll recognize some friends from my life today. Oh, you're, you're in that healing group with me. Wow. Very cool. So it's a fun thing we can do in these sessions is understand who in our life today we are connected with in spirit in a very intimate way. So another experience we can have in the Life Between Lives session is visiting what Newton called the Council of Elders. These are very wise, compassionate, exalted beings. Maybe a few steps above a spirit guide. These beings will assemble almost like a panel and will come before this panel and will talk to them. There may be three of them. There may be five or seven or even nine. I've noticed depending on our maybe level of development or our number of interests. The more developed we are or the more interest we have, we'll tend to have more elders come to our meeting. So in our session, we can talk to these elders. I can dialogue with them. How is she doing as a soul? Is she developing? Is she on the right track? What are her strengths? What are her weaknesses? What does she need to work on in this life right now? What should she focus on? These kinds of things. And so also have the, bring, have the client bring in a list of questions. And hopefully if we meet with a council of wise ones, we can get her questions addressed. Mm. It kind of leads me to maybe backtracking a little bit. Why do people even come to these sessions? There are lots of reasons. I get a lot of clients who are in a crisis or a fork in the road. Maybe there's a decision they have to make, or maybe they're just stuck, stuck in the mud. They just don't know where to go or what to do next. So, I'd say people are mainly looking for guidance and direction in their life. Who am I and what am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. Um, you know, life purpose, guidance and direction. Another thing people are looking for is, well, let's say help with issues. I have this relationship with my son, it's just not going well, I don't know what to do, what should I be doing for him? 
So, or you know, a spouse or anything like that. We can look at relationships. We can look at career, career, and um, you know, finances and that kind of thing. What am, what am I supposed to be doing? I, I'm working this job, but you know, it's not really fulfilling me the way I wish. I, I really want to be an architect or something like that. So, we can look at those kinds of things. Sometimes people have health issues that they want to explore. You know, I've got this thing, and it's just dragging me down. Is there anything anybody can do up here to help me out? At least uh, maybe something I can learn about. So these are mainly the uh, reasons people come to these sessions. And in the council or with the spirit guides, we can talk about these things, get them some guidance, bring some light down into their human life, bring some a light at the end of the tunnel. There are places in spirit you might know as the Akashic Records. Everything is recorded. Every thought, every word, every deed, every circumstance, every situation, every dream. It's all recorded. And in the Life Between Lives session, we can go and access this. We might call it a library or a hall of records, and so we can go into this vast area, this amazing place. Uh, people describe it as just endless corridors that go down like to infinity, and books or videos or information, scrolls, information in many different forms, and so it's something fun that we can we can explore. Maybe they want to look at past lives. Maybe they were... I've had a few people who are scientists or inventors. They want to consult the Hall of Records to get some information about uh, an invention. Get some scientific... Maybe we can make a breakthrough. Who knows? It's all, it's all there. It's all available to us. Another thing I'd like to talk about is looking at past lives and that many of us do have lives in other worlds besides the Earth. The universe is a big place, right? It's very large. The Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, has something like 200 billion stars. And there are billions of galaxies. It's big. And so there are many places to go. Um, the Earth is a beautiful gem. I love it. It's gorgeous. But there are many, many places to go. And so sometimes in our sessions we'll explore. People have lives in other places. I get a lot of people coming to me and they just feel they're not at home on the Earth. They feel different than everyone else. A lot of people who are very sensitive maybe come from worlds that are a little milder than Earth. Earth can be a bit of a tough neighborhood sometimes, right? <laughs> so, a lot of challenges down here. It's not for the weak. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, and so, you know, we'll explore it. What, what was your life like there? I had someone very recently uh, that we explored this last week, and wow, I mean, her other existence is just, just gorgeous. You know, but why are you here in the earth now? Well, I, I wanted to, uh, I want to help this place to rise up. I've had people tell me that uh, right now in our earth history is sort of a watershed moment. It's an opportunity for us to raise the earth to a higher level. And there are beings from all over the universe who have flocked here in human bodies. They have incarnated as us. I mean, many of us here have lived in other worlds. But they've all come here. Uh, earth is like the Las Vegas of the universe right now. It's, just, it's really happening. There's a lot going on. It's very exciting. And they want to help. So, it's very, very cool. There's a lot going on 
You know, we have a lot going on. We think, well, you know, we're born and we identify with this body and this life, and it's just everything. And if I stub my toe, oh my God, you know, it's so such a big thing. Well, you know, in the scheme of things, we only bring a portion of ourself into any one life. Other fragments of ourself are off doing other things. We have lots going on. We have projects and explorations and jobs and things that we're doing. Living an earth life is important and it's precious. And every moment is precious. Every life is precious and yet it's a grain of sand, you know, in the universe. Another very important thing in the Life Between Lives session is sometimes people want to reunite with a loved one who has crossed over. Part of living is dying, and we all lose people that we love. It's a sad part of being alive. It's losing those that we are close to. And so we wonder, you know, what what happens to them? Their body's there and you know, we, we bury it or burn it or do whatever we do. Do they still exist? This is something that we all wonder. And so in these sessions, sometimes we can visit with the crossed over loved ones. Maybe it's, you know, grandma or father or maybe it's a child that you've lost and so it's so heartbreaking sometimes it's so heartbreaking but in the sessions we can go and visit with these loved ones we can talk with them and I can ask them questions how are you feeling now well I'm great all that stuff you know I've I've been through the houses of healing and I feel much better. And I'm starting to work with other people. I'll ask them, what are you doing in spirit? How are you spending your time? Well, you know, I have a job. I, I work with these souls who have newly crossed over and I help them adjust. Or maybe I'm working with the healers because I'm, I'm really a healer too. Or maybe they're taking a vacation or a rest. You know, I'm going on a trip. I'm going on the grand tour of the planets, you know, of, of the galaxies, and I'm going to explore for a while. It's great. And so this just tends to be very comforting for the client, the person who is left behind, knowing that their loved one still exists, they're still alive, they have interests and activities, and they also check in with you, when you're on the earth, your loved one will observe you, sometimes give us signs, turning a light on or off, um, knocking over a, you know, a statue or something. They will give us signs that you, know, you find a letter that they wrote, these types of things. So it's very cool, very comforting for people to know that their loved ones do still exist and they will see them again. And towards the end of the session, we'll sometimes visit a, or revisit, the time of the planning for the current lifetime. So when I was planning to be me, what was going on? It's sort of a conference table, and I have a few guides, and maybe a few soul friends, and we're, we're planning out my life. And so this is the time to find out what the heck was I going to do with this life anyway? Because I've, I've forgotten. So what, what did I want to do? What was I planning? So we can, we can get that information for the client. Have them remember you know, what they wanted to accomplish. It's a very cool. And so there are other experiences in the Life Between Lives session that again, have not been written about because everyone's different. Everyone has different, you know, interests and different experiences. I've had a couple pretty fascinating clients. 
One of them that comes to mind is a fellow, and it's in one of uh, Rich Martini's books. This fellow that we're in a past life, and somehow he, he connects with the spirit of the earth. And so we sort of jump on that, and we sort of dialogue with the soul of the earth, or you know, whatever you want to call that. Well, what is the earth all about? How did it get here? Uh, you know, who, who started this place? What do you do? How are we doing as humans on the earth? So this is a fascinating stuff. I had another woman recently who, she was able to connect with her sort of soul's mother, or this other soul who nurtured her and cared for her as she was just created as a soul. So this wise, maternal, older soul, and we dialogued with her for, for quite a while. So, just fascinating. I have one other client, maybe I want to mention. This was a fellow who had, he had dreams of sort of falling through the sky and colors and bursts and, and he was also fascinated with airplanes and, and flight. And he just had a feeling this had something to do with the past life and so we explored that. And well, of course, we find that he's a war, World War II pilot. He's a co-pilot. He's in a plane flying over Europe. And their plane is hit by ground fire, flak. The pilot's head is blown off. So he, as the co-pilot, needs to jump into this plane that is just damaged beyond you know, help. He's trying to hold, he has like four other guys, besides the pilot who's now gone, he has four other guys that he's, he feels responsible for, and he's trying to pull the plane up, but he just can't. And so, the guys that can, they eject, and he actually is falling through the sky in his past life. Uh, but he has a parachute, he makes it safely down to earth, but he lands in a forest, it's very cold, he's hiding, he's in enemy territory. He's hiding in a very cold place, he ends up freezing to death that night. And so, we also find that none of his other friends made it out alive, none of them survived. And so, you know, we wonder, what's this all about? Why was this coming back to him? Why was he having visions of falling through the sky? Why is he obsessed with airplanes? Why does this have sort of a hold on him? It's keeping him from moving forward. And so, what I sort of realized and what we found was that he, I believe he was holding a guilt that he wasn't able to save everybody. And so hopefully our sessions helped him to overcome that. I wrote to him recently asking if I could tell a story today. And he said, sure. And he also said that doing those sessions helped me understand that my soul continues on. And that's the most important thing. So there's a postscript to this story, which is the coolest part. After he left, I went outside my office uh, to check my mail. We have mailboxes outside in this sort of patio. So I walk outside, I'm checking the mail, I look up, I happen to see there's a red-tailed hawk, you know, the hawks that we have hovering here in Southern California. This beautiful hawk, I was like, wow, that's great. It's kind of like my totem animal, because they don't even flap, they just ride the thermals. Very cool. And then I see this, the second hawk come. I'm like, wow, that's cool. I know sometimes they hunt in mating pairs. So I was like, wow, just watching them. And I'm checking my mail. And then a third hawk comes. I'm like, wow, I don't think I've, maybe that's their baby, you know, something. I don't know. It looked a little smaller. 
Okay, and then a fourth and a fifth hawk. I've never seen five hawks wheeling around in the sky over my head. And so I think back to that crew of that plane. And I'm thinking, okay, what's this all about? It's sort of a sign. It's sort of a salute to that gentleman who did his best to save these people. So, I think I'll pretty much end my talk there. A couple other announcements I just wanted to make. Very exciting. Tomorrow, December 8th, 2019, the Newton Institute coming out with a brand new book, Wisdom of Souls. This is something that about two dozen of the Newton Institute members have contributed to and worked on. All kinds of these stories and information about these Life Between Lives sessions. I think it would be a very interesting and fascinating read for people who are into this kind of thing. So that will be available on Amazon and wherever you get great books. I also wanted to mention my friend, Rich Martini. He's in the back of the room here today. He's done a lot of work with me and Jennifer Schaefer and lots of other people to promote the understanding of our afterlife and our eternal nature. I just want to remind you, he has all kinds of books. Flip side, it's a wonderful afterlife. Hacking the afterlife. His books with Jennifer, Backstage Pass to the Afterlife. Very fun, very fascinating. A warm, friendly, loving man. A good friend of mine. Just wanted to remind you about him. This is my website if you want to contact me. Lightbetweenlives.com Be happy to answer any questions you have online. Just email me and let me know. So. We're going to take some questions and answers now. Before we do that, I want to thank you for sitting and sharing this time with me. I really appreciate it. Anybody have a question? I have two questions. What is the difference between a spirit guide and a guardian angel? And also, you spoke about life in other worlds. Uh, what about life in other dimensions? <clears throat> Excuse me. Beautiful questions. So, what's the difference between spirit guides and guardian angels? I think the terms could be sort of used interchangeably. But the way I understand it is that our spirit guides are souls who have incarnated. They have lived in earthly lives. And so they've kind of been there and done that. So they have a little more of the grit of you know, being down and dirty in the earth life. They know what it's like to be hungry. They know what it's like to be hurt. All these kinds of things. So they have a little bit of more experience. I think guardian angels, you know, angels, awesome beings, of course, but most in the angelic realm do not incarnate into physical bodies, in my understanding. Hey, there's always exceptions, but yeah, that's basically, I think, the difference. The angelic beings, they do not incarnate. And so they don't have the same experience that a spirit guide has. Now, angels are aware of things that we may not be aware of. You know, perhaps they're closer to the divine in some way. And so it's all good. And we're lucky to have all of the help we can get. <clears throat> 
And your second question about, we'll get, we'll get to you, sir. The second question about lives in other dimensions, yes, absolutely do find this. I don't really understand what different dimensions are, to be honest with you. I'm not a physicist or, you know, I'm not that smart. But I know there are other realms, there are other worlds, other spheres that beings do live in. Um, probably about three months ago I had a client who is living an earth life and maybe a series of earth lives, but she really comes from a, a different dimension. Her real existence is from, you know, dimension nine or whatever, dimension X, and so, um, you know, for her coming here, it's quite a, you know, quite a, I don't know, how, to, how can I put it? <laughs> I don't want to say that, but, you know, quite a sort of a letdown, but, you know, people go into these experiences for certain reasons, so, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but life in other dimensions, absolutely. In fact, right now, we're all have an existence in other dimensions, in higher dimensions. So, absolutely. I think there was a question over here. Uh, I've had my share of experiences, and the issue or the thing I have is I read a lot I watch a lot of movies, I have a lot of life experience over the years, and uh, it's hard to distinguish sometimes what I'm making up, because I have very vivid imagination, and I have had experiences, but it's, it's really hard to figure out, is, is that my brain just making things up, just like a dream, you wake up from a dream, and it's all in your head, and it's all being made up someplace, and, or is it, from someplace else, but it's really hard. There's no uh, finite way of distinguishing reality, uh, what is real, from what is fanciful. And secondly, when you do these past life regressions, do you ever take it to the next level where you actually do historical research to find? Because I've, I've had, I, I've read about that being done, and it's uh, somewhat amazing sometimes when you have a young child does past life regression and they suddenly have a lot of facts. That come out. I'm, I'm kind of a very practical person. I'd like to take it to that next level and so I put some scientific evidence on, on top of this. So, uh, yes, sir, uh, I hear you. I think that. Let me answer this. Let me address the second part first. Um, I have a lot of clients who are very interested in. Um, backing up, you know, we have this session, they say all this crazy stuff, whatever, and they're like, you know, is this real? So we have the internet now, right? And so we can research just about anything and everything uh, pretty well. And so a lot of people have a, a big interest in um, substantiating, you know, somehow substantiating what they have found in their session. Um, and sometimes they'll tell me about it. Some people write me, they'll, they'll show me pictures of places and this is the palace. I found it on the internet. I, that's the one, same one I saw. And we were in the bedroom of that place and all that kind of thing. So it's pretty interesting, it's fascinating to me. Personally, I don't really care because I know, I have a feeling of, you know, I know this is real. It's something I've had ever since I was a child. I don't have any much doubt about these things. And when I do the sessions, um, I can feel the, you know, what's the word? Validity. I'm sorry? Validity. Validity. <laughs> That's a, a perfect. I can feel the validity. I feel the realness of of this uh, experience. So I think, uh, you know, if people want to do the research and look these things up, that's awesome. I love to hear about it. It's always fun to hear of someone 
comes up with some facts to back up, you know, what seems like hazy, crazy stuff. And so that does hook into the other part of your question is like, you know, am I just making this up? Am I just imagining all of this, right? Or wondering. Or, uh, you know, I just watched the movie Dances with Wolves, and now I'm an Indian, like, geez. I probably just, you know, probably making it up, right? Because that movie and whatever. So, and my question would be, well, maybe you watched Dances with Wolves because you were an Indian. So it's a chicken and egg kind of thing. But, you know, how do you tell during a session if it's real or not? For the client, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough to tell. In fact, as I would explain to you, as I'm going to explain to you today when we do our group session, that's a big part of it. You've kind of uh, psychically jumped ahead. It's a big part of it. Am I making it up? Is it real? I love people who, you know, have this incredible session. They'll go through like 10 Kleenexes, they got mascara, you know, train tracks down their face, and then they'll walk out and they'll look at me, they'll go, was that real? <laughs> I don't know. That's for you to decide. I remember I had a woman come to me and it was like that, really intense, like five hours, this life to life session all about um, love stuff. So it was really emotional. And um, a week later she writes me and she says, hey Scott, thanks for the session, but I just don't think it was real. I'm just gonna discard it. And I was like, okay. I mean, when I drove home from that session, I knew that was a killer session. Like, I have done my job today. I did a good job, I felt good. You know, I helped this girl, you know, release these emotions. I helped her get through all this stuff, and then she just wants to say that it wasn't real. But that's for her to decide. That's her choice, you know? So, like, two years later, she, she writes me and she says, Hey, Scott, I'm going to bring my friend to come see you and do a session. I'm like, okay. We didn't talk about her session at all. She just brought her friend. We did a great session. But it just tells me that she finally came to the realization that, you know, it was meaningful. So, to not to over, uh, you know, answer this, but, you know, how do I know if it's real, like, like during the thing? You can't, really. You have to just roll with it. You'll have the rest of your life, like this girl, two years maybe to analyze it. So try not to just analyze it while we're doing it. Try to have an adventure. Try to enjoy yourself. Just see where it goes. And you can analyze it later. But I would say that, and Rich would probably agree with me, when I'm asking questions, maybe it's a guide or something like that, and I'll say, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the answer will come like even before I've finished my question. That means that you're dialed in. It doesn't mean that if you need some time to think about it or some time to come that it's not real. But I think when the answer comes before the question's even finished, it's a sign. You know, it's not really you because you don't even have time to think about it. It's coming from somewhere else. So that may be one indication. In our session that we do today, um, we're going to ask these questions and things. Just go with the first thing that comes up. Someone's going to pop in. Just say, okay, there, there you go. So I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. I have a question about soul groups, and I've read Rick's books of like three to 25 people. Do you have any idea... Is that like one circle with everyone in it, or is it more like like overlapping circles? So someone could be in my soul group, but not really be in the soul group of, say, someone who I think is my true love. 
Yes, that's a very interesting thing. Soul groups, you know, like, uh, let's say a classroom, say a high school class. Say there's 25 people in the class, right? You're probably not really super tight with those 25 people, even though they're in the same class. There's probably three or four of them that you hang out with. You go and eat lunch, right, in the quad or whatever. So it's kind of like that. You have your sort of inner circle, you're close, maybe three, four, five, six, seven people that you're very close to. That's what I, excuse me, that's what I tend to find is that, yeah, there are going to be some people that you're very close to. And remember when I talked about we could have more than one group? So you might have a group with these people. And then you might have a group with these people. They might even have a group that you're not in. So you might have in these other two groups that you have nothing to do with. So there's all kinds of permutations and you know um, mixes with friends. You know, the most important thing I would probably say about all this afterlife stuff is there are people that it's very important for them to put things in boxes and categories and say it's like this and it's like that. Well, the one thing I could I can share with you today and I, I'd love to share with you is that the more sessions that I do, the more I realize we can't fit everything into a box. We just can't. You know, there are always exceptions to everything. So everything I've told you today is probably just a bunch of hooey. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I can answer these questions, you know, I act like some, some kind of an expert. What do I know? I'm just a guy. I do these sessions. I do the best I can. We come up with new information, like, every week. It's incredible. So, so we do our best. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I read all of Michael Newton's books and a lot of Rich Martini's and a lot of other books. I, I am an avid reader and I've talked to people. I have two questions. I have heard from other people and read that you couldn't live more than one life at the same time because not 100% of your spirit or energy is in any one life. Okay, is there an average of a number of lives that you, in your opinion, is there an average of a number of lives that you can live at one time? Also, too, I've also read and been told that everybody has had an experience of being both genders in different lives. That we've been men and we've been women to get a fuller perspective of, of uh, our existence. So I would like your take on these two questions. What's with all the two-part questions today? <laughs> you guys are really, you're taxing my mind. It's like, what, 11 o'clock? I'm usually asleep. <laughs> I'm, te I'm teasing. So, okay, let me think about that for a minute. I'm sorry, what were the questions again? <laughs> oh. Can we live more than one life at a time? Is there an average, in your opinion, that we can live more than one life at a time? Like, can we live more than five, six, at once, and then give me Well, that's, a, that's an amazing question. I don't know how to answer that. Most of my clients are living one physical life. And they may have other parts of themselves in more spiritual existences. But I do have some clients that are living parallel human lifetimes, even on the earth. Maybe there are two people. I think I had one recently. They're living three human lives right now on the same world. And so they may be living another physical life on planet X as a tree man or something. I, I don't know. But, but what's the average? I mean, I don't know. I haven't really done a study 
or haven't tried to like statistically figure things out. But I would say for the most part, we're using a large portion of our energy in this one physical human life. And then we, we may have other part of us doing other things. There are those who live parallel lives, but most of us don't. Oh, yeah. Everyone having had <clears throat> an experience in past lives at one time a man and one time a woman, so we can have a more rounded experience of existence. Yes, I find that to usually be the case. So when you say everyone, again, I want to caution against uh, making saying any absolutes because there may be some who have never. They have only stayed one gender, but for the most part, yes, we will uh, live different genders, different um, ethnicities, different parts of the world, different socio-economic levels, you know, from peasant up to king and everything in between. We want to have, we want to round out our experience, as you say, we want to round out that, those experiences. What's it like to live as a, you know, rich guy in the castle? Well, there are responsibilities we don't really think about. What's it like to live as a you know, poor tenant farmer, you know, or a slave, or an untouchable, or something like that? Yes, we want to learn all of these things. We want to round out our... And what's it like to be handicapped, to be born with no legs, or something like that? These are things we want to understand. So, yeah. Gender-wise, will tend to, I think most of my clients will tend to, you know, they tend to be a feminine or a masculine. So they'll live maybe, you know, 70% of their lives as a, as a male, because they have a masculine energy and they, they express, you know, more naturally through a male body or vice versa. It might be female. So most tend one way or the other, but even if the most masculine man will say, you know, I need to develop my sensitive side and my intuition. I think I'm going to incarnate as a woman. These guides are telling me, maybe I should do that. I'm like, all right. I'll give it a go. Okay, thank you so much, Scott. Oh, um, welcome. We are going to break now uh, till 11.30. There, there will be food out in the lobby. And then we're going to reconvene at noon, and Scott is going to take us on a group experience. Hold on now? Yeah. Are we going to reconvene at what time? 11.30. 11.30. Okay. Yes, sorry. Thank you so much.